Etihad's Abu Dhabi hub sucks, plain and simple. If only there was a new terminal that they could move to. Hi there, my name is Kevin and I make honest and to the point narrated trip reports about airlines and hotels all over the world. This is episode 118 and today we are completing our trip to Milan with a flight in Etihad's business class from Abu Dhabi. The full experience begins in 10 seconds. Welcome to 11 p.m. at Abu Dhabi's International Airport. I just arrived from Jakarta and have the pleasure of spending the next four hours here. It's been around five years since I was last here, and I had high hopes that they would have kinda, sorta, maybe sorted out the chaos that it used to be. Newsflash, that has yet to happen. As we navigate the winding, duty-free menage where Terminal 1 and 3 meet, check out the description below if you'd like to know the exact fare that I paid, or my next five videos in queue. But first... The following video is an honest review of a flight that actually happened. This video is not sponsored by any travel-related company and is filmed anonymously. This video may include praise for a soft blanket and or disturbing nitpicky dialogue related to simmering urinals. Viewer discretion is not necessary, it's just my opinion. If you suspect that you or someone that you love may have unknowingly been exposed to content with a heinous hidden sponsorship, please ask the content creator how much they paid. If you enjoy and appreciate authentic and honest content, please support the channel by giving this video a thumbs up and subscribing with notifications on. There are also more ways to support the channel in the description below. After all, y'all are the only sponsors of this video. When I began mounting my camera on my spinner bag, I had no idea that it would become a butt cam, but here we are. Right now, we're heading to the business class lounge in Terminal 3. Etihad has transitioned from an airline with global ambitions to one with a boutique mentality over the past years, something I spoke about in my last Etihad video. But today, I want to focus on their beautiful midfield terminal, which is just sitting there. First, let's take a quick stroll through the lounge and make our way to the shower suites. I was 5th in line when I arrived, with around a 20 minute wait. The space got the job done, but it was tiny and stiflingly hot and humid inside the shower suite, to the point where not only was I sweating profusely, but even my carry-ons needed to be wiped down a bit once I found a seat in the lounge. Oh, and the simmering urinals? You caught that? Yeah, so I'm not going to include a photo or video of it because it's vile. But in the primary men's restroom, the only two urinals were literally at a rolling boil with steam venting out from them, and it wasn't clear water. I've never seen something like it, and I hope I never have to see something like it again. Isn't that a wonderful transition to talk about the food on offer? It was fine, but nothing special. Sorry that I don't have more footage of the food, the lounge was so crowded that I just wasn't too comfortable leaving my bags at my seat for any period of time. Time to head down to our bus gate one level below the lounge in the area that I like to refer to as the Passenger Punishment Lounge. As global travel began to recover after the 2008 recession, Etihad, obviously supported by the Abu Dhabi government, planned for a new midfield terminal to replace the terminals which they projected to soon be capacity strained. Construction of the midfield terminal began in 2012 and was due to open in 2017. In 2017, it was still due to open in 2017, but was then suddenly delayed by two years. It's been reported that since 2019, the terminal has been 98% complete, but has been sitting there unchanged for three years, with the latest development being the government-controlled airport operator canceling the $3 billion construction contract in 2021. When, or if really, the new midfield terminal will ever open is still unknown. I arrived at a teeny tiny gate area which at the moment was servicing four different European flights, luckily just a few minutes before boarding. Let's check out the early morning flight stats. We'd be taking off almost an hour late and would climb up to 38,000 feet on this just under 6 hour flight to Milan, landing 9 minutes behind schedule. Business class passengers, Etihad elite members, and families with 14 or more carry-ons were piled into the premium bus for a drive to the aircraft all the way on the other side of Terminal 1. We did have some great wide-body views though. With all of the changes that Etihad has gone through over the past years, it's worth taking a closer look at their wide-body fleet. Today, we'd be flying on one of their 787-9s which they have 30 of with 11 more on order. They also have 9 of the Dash 10 variant with 21 additional coming. 5 of the A350-1000s with the new business class interior, with 15 more on the way, 
the A350 is meant to replace their aging fleet of nine remaining 777s, which are slowly being taken out of service. I do think that Etihad has one of the classier liveries out there, and I'm always a fan of an up-in-your-face engine view. I can't wait to have the same view of a 777X if they ever find their way into anyone's fleet. Considering we're in the desert, not really sure why the stairs had to be covered and limit the beautiful views. I stepped on board and turned left into what would be a completely sold out cabin and would nearly be surrounded by children and babies. Oh, joy. Seats on this six-year-old 787-9 are the same as my last flight, but I'm just on the opposite side now in 8 Alpha. On all two class 787-9s like ours is today, you'll want to avoid row 9 due to a missing window. In the three class version of this aircraft, the missing window is in row 5. If you're traveling alone, the Alpha and Kilo seats are surely the best, as they're right next to the window and also forward facing, which I don't really think makes a big difference, but I know many prefer it. In general, the seat just looks very smart and stylish. Actually, this one seems to be in better condition than my last flight, which was still very good, but on a newer aircraft. My only gripe about these seats is how shallow the seat cushion itself is. And here is row 9 behind me with its missing window. At each seat, you'll find a pillow waiting for you. Next to it, you have a fancy pants light fixture, which also has a reading light on top. Below it is your armrest, come storage area, with a literature pocket in front and a water bottle holder on the side. Upon boarding, the headphones and water bottle are in the storage area. On your footrest, you'll find this morning's menu, as well as a wrapped blanket. Duval Leroy Brute Reserve was offered before takeoff, and we can see our first look at the amenity kit and browse the IFE on our remote, just next to the seat control LED screen. The chunky table uniquely folds out from the seat divider module and is as sturdy as a brick and moves enough away so that you can escape during meal service. Then we have my favorite blanket in all of the skies. It's a type of blanket that Qatar and Turkish also offer, but Etihad's is just so much softer, almost unnaturally soft. Well. Uh, not almost, it's surely all polyester. I do wish that it was as long as Qatar's version though. Just fine are the words that I'd use to describe the pillow. The foot cubby is especially deep, surely to balance out how shallow the seat cushion is. Then we have the amenity kits. Don't really understand them for Etihad. First, the Aqua de Parma zipper bag is much more useful than the document clutch that I got on my last flight. The thing that I don't understand is, why is there more stuff in this one, including socks and an eye mask, when the other, which was a longer flight, didn't have those. Headphones are also in the just fine category, but I still choose to use my own. A peek at the menu card and into the cockpit before we start our pushback. You can see the octopus-like midfield terminal in the upper right. We'd be taking off to the southeast before pulling a Yui and heading up to the Persian Gulf. The spool up and takeoff are next.
a bit of a nothing burger view. Let's pretend the cabin is still dark and take a look at the bed in full flat mode. For the vast majority of sleepers, it will make for a comfortable sleep, being both long enough and wide enough to offer a bit of wiggle room in just about every direction. Seat covers are not provided, but the seats are fairly soft. Actually, the firmness can be controlled, but I'm not a big fan of it since it makes you feel like you're sitting on a big flat balloon. Our route today would take us just north of Qatar before crossing over Kuwait, Iraq, Turkey, and continuing over the Balkans. Most in the cabin chose to reserve a dish for later in the flight and just go straight to sleep, but I had scientific research to do, so I made the disastrous decision of ordering a Cipriani Bellini. What can I say? I saw the bottle on my previous flight and it looked pretty. Five stars for branding and packaging, negative 18 stars for taste. I cannot remember the last time I had to spit out a drink. I'm not sure I even ever spit out a drink before, and I've had raw fermented horse milk in Kyrgyzstan. It was better than this Bellini. Here's the full menu for the flight. The service is all on demand and a la carte. I've zoomed in on the good parts and have the US retail prices of the wine menu in red font. For now, I just had the steak sandwich, which back in the day, Etihad used to have quite the reputation for. Almost as ubiquitous in flight reviews as the lobster thermidor is in Singapore Airlines reviews. This one was flavorful and tough as tender flannel. I ended up having a cheese and arugula sandwich and ate the meat with a knife and fork since my teeth weren't quite up to the challenge. Bathrooms on board were identical to my last flight and kept in good condition throughout. Bonus points if you already knew that this was the same recycled clip from my last review. As we passed over the oil fields of Kuwait, is that, are they even called oil fields? I settled in for a nap. A few hours later, I woke up over Serbia and saw firsthand why some people hate 787 windows. This is at their darkest setting. I don't mind the light, but I can say from experience that you would be able to feel the heat from that. We were crossing the Croatian coast to the Adriatic Sea as my breakfast was served. It was ginormous. I reserved an Arabic breakfast in the beginning of the flight. In reality, it was just all surprisingly bland. The mango yogurt parfait ended up being my favorite thing on the tray just since it had a bit of flavor. I was impressed to see a proper iced coffee glass though. That brings me to the service. Generally, my flight attendant on this flight was friendlier than on my previous, but my god, she constantly got way too close when talking. I mean like six inches away from my face. Anyway, she was pleasant enough, but the service did feel rushed. As we start our approach and cross directly over Venice, let me mention one weird thing about the crew. When I boarded, I was greeted by a male flight attendant who said that he was going to take care of me on this flight. Very nice guy. A few moments later, there was a chat between him and the purser. I mean, he, he didn't punch her, but he didn't really look too thrilled. He got his bag and got off the plane. A few moments later, the female flight attendant who would actually be serving me came on board and introduced herself just before taxiing. Don't really know what happened. Only two things that I can imagine were, one, he was fired, or he tested positive for COVID. But I have no idea what their testing protocols are these days. It was just odd. The cabin was readied for arrival and we began our descent over northern Italy. For this flight, I definitely chose the wrong side of the aircraft, missing out on those views of the Alps. I did enjoy racing the shadow though. A very quick taxi brought us to the gate to what seemed to be an empty Milan Malpensa airport. Alright, so as we get into the flip flop score, what are we thinking? The flight itself was okay, food could have been better, service could have been paced better. But overall, the flight itself was decent. 
But that airport in Abu Dhabi is just a haphazard mess, and even with Etihad still running at reduced capacity compared to pre-COVID, the airport was still ready to burst at the seams. Etihad has done well transforming their business and returning to profitability. But without that new midfield terminal, they're never going to truly be a premium boutique carrier. I really do hope that you enjoyed this video and will give it a thumbs up and turn on notifications so that you can catch my next four videos which will include some beautiful hotels in Milan as well as a Singapore Airlines business class flight.